I'd like to begin with uh, President Benson, a very important clarification. He's talked about the difficulties and the challenges, and then he makes this statement, that there is a bright side to an otherwise gloomy picture, the coming of our Lord in all his glory. His coming will be both glorious and terrible, depending on the spiritual condition of those who remain. Now note, his first appearance will be to the righteous saints who have gathered to the New Jerusalem. In this place of refuge they will be safe from the wrath of the Lord, which will be poured out without measure on all nations. And then he goes on and says, The second appearance of the Lord will be to the Jews to those beleaguered sons of Judah surrounded by hostile Gentile armies who again threaten to overrun Jerusalem. The Savior, their Messiah, will appear and set his feet on the Mount of Olives, and it shall cleave in twain, and the earth shall tremble and reel to and fro, and the heavens also shall be shaken. The Lord himself will then rout the Gentile armies, decimating their forces. He says, Judah will be spared, no longer to be persecuted and scattered. The Jews will then approach their deliverer and ask, What are these wounds in thy hands and in thy feet? And then the Savior says, I will say unto them, These are the wounds with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. All right, now, the third appearance, he says, of Christ will be to the rest of the world. Here, in his, here is his description of his coming. And the Lord shall be red in his apparel, and his garments like him that treadeth in the wine vat. And so great shall be the glory of his presence, that the sun shall hide his face in shame, the moon shall withhold its light, and the stars shall be hurtled from their places. All nations will see him in the clouds of heaven, clothed with power and great glory, with all the holy angels. And the Lord shall utter his voice, and all the ends of the earth shall hear it, and uh, the nations of the earth shall mourn, and they that have laughed shall see their folly." Now he's quoting from the Doctrine and Covenants, section 133 and 145. What I'd like to emphasize here is that the coming of the Lord is not one great dramatic event. It's going to happen some Sunday afternoon when all the saints are at Lake Powell or somewhere else, uh, or out in the ballpark playing. The Lord, rather instead, will make a series of appearances, and those appearances will extend over a number of years, and they will finally consummate in his coming in glory in the clouds of heaven. Let me. For example, turn to another uh, earlier brethren, Charles W. Penrose, who was one of the uh, brightest minds of his day and a member also of the First Presidency of the Church. As he speaks of the uh, events leading up to the Second Coming of Christ, he says this, Through the preaching of the gospel of Christ, as revealed through Joseph Smith, Many among all nations will be led to forsake the traditions of their fathers and become numbered with the people of God. These will, be, will gather to one place to prepare themselves for the appearance of the Savior. And that one place isn't just Jackson County. As we made clear this afternoon, Zion is actually a complex of cities, cities of Zion, of uh, 15 to 20,000 uh, inhabitants each extending, as the Lord informed the Prophet Joseph Smith, from the Appalachians to the Pacific Ocean and without north or south boundary. So when you talk about gathering to one place, it's like section 42 refers to the idea that they are gathered administratively into the city of the New Jerusalem, but that you do have stakes then established in outlying areas. Now he says, these will uh, gathered to one place to prepare themselves for the appearance of the Savior by learning through his inspired servants 
the things which are pleasing to him, and purifying themselves from those things which he hates. They will build unto him a holy temple of necessity some form of government, that is, political government, must be set up among them as they will exist in a national as well as an ecclesiastical capacity. Their government, or this government, will be a theocracy, or in other words, the kingdom of God. The laws, ordinances, regulations, etc., will be under the direction of God's priesthood, and the people will progress in arts, sciences, and everything that will produce happiness, promote union, and establish them in righteousness and strength and everlasting peace. And then he says, now on the other hand, because of the darkness that fills the world, he says, uh, the minds of men will become blacker, nations will engage in frightful and bloody warfare, and the crimes which are now becoming so frequent will be of continual occurrence. The ties that bind together families and kindreds will be disregarded and violated, and the passions of human nature will be put to their vilest uses, and the very elements will seem to be convulsed by the corruption that prevails. See? Now, this is a pretty good commentary on 1991. And it was written in 1859, see, written in the spirit of prophecy. Now, as President Penrose then continues in his explanation, he said, We may consider the inhabitants of the earth at the time immediately preceding the coming of Christ under three general divisions. First, the Latter-day Saints gathered together here on the western continent to a place called Zion, with its center, in its center place of Zion, busily preparing for his appearance in their midst as their Redeemer who had shed his blood for their salvation, now coming to reign over them and to reward them for their labors in establishing his government. Some people think that when Christ comes, he's going to initiate the program. This is not true. When he comes, he's going to take the reins of government which his living priesthood through revelation have established, and he's going to come and reward them for the work that they have done. Now, the second group, he says, consists of the Jewish people who are also expecting the Messiah, but uh, do not believe that Jesus of Nazareth was the Son of God, and being in danger of destruction from their Gentile enemies. Now, he says, the third group then consists of the corrupt nations and kingdoms of men who, rejecting the light of the gospel, are unprepared for the Lord's advent and are almost ripe for destruction. Now, as you talk about the appearance of Christ, his coming, he says, among the first mentioned of these three classes of men, the Lord will make his appearance first. And who is that? among the Latter-day Saints. All right, and what President Benson says? The same thing. You see? And he says, And that appearance will be unknown to the rest of mankind. He will come to the temple prepared for him, and his faithful saints will behold his face, hear his voice, and gaze upon his glory. From his own lips they will receive further instructions for the development and beautifying of Zion and for the extension and sure stability of his kingdom. All right, his next appearance after he's appeared to the saints in Zion. And let me just add this in per uh, parenthetically, that that appearance will extend over a period of time, and it isn't just that he will then appear in his temple in Jackson County, which he will do, but that he will be among the saints for some time before that. We want to discuss here tomorrow sometime or Saturday, I can't quite remember the agenda program, uh, his coming to his temple, and uh, that coming then will be preceded by his appearance among the Latter-day Saints at earlier times. Uh, he says, now, his next appearance will be among the distressed and nearly vanquished sons of Judah. And he talks about them and the crisis of their faith and the Savior standing upon the Mount of Olives. And then at their deliverance, he says, they will be baptized for the remission of their sins and receive the gift of the Holy Ghost and the government of God as established in Zion, will be set up among them, no more to be thrown down forever. See, uh, it's like Paul says in Romans chapter 11, I think about verse 25, where he says, Out of Zion shall go forth the Deliverer, and turn on godliness from Jacob. See, the program is first of all established among the saints in Zion. It's among the birthright tribe. Ephraim is the one then charged with the responsibility of coming up to his inheritance, which is to receive the fullness of priesthood and preside and direct in the Church and in the kingdom of God and in the temple of God. See, And Ephraim then 
the birthright tribe will be that body from which redemption will go to other branches of Israel, the Indian people, the ten tribes when they come, and uh, the Jewish people. Uh, the program will go forth out of Zion. And so he says they will be baptized, and the, king, the government of God as established in Zion will be set up among them, and including the economic order, the whole program will be set up then in Jerusalem. Now he says the great and grand advent of the Lord will be subsequent to these appearances, these two appearances. But who can describe it in the language of mortals? The tongue of man falters, and the pen drops in the hand of the writer, as the mind is wrapped in contemplation of the sublime and awful majesty of his coming to take vengeance on the ungodly and reign as king of the whole earth. He comes, the earth shakes, the tall mountains tremble, the mighty deep rolls back to the north as in fear, and the rent skies glow like molten brass. He comes, the dead saints burst forth from their tombs, and those who are alive and remain are caught up with them to meet him. The ungodly rush to hide themselves in his presence and call upon the quivering rocks to cover them. He comes with all the hosts of the righteous glorified. The breath of his lips strikes death to the wicked. His glory is a consuming fire. The proud and the rebellious are a stubble. They are burned and left neither root nor branch, which are genealogical terms. Roots has reference to their ancestries and branches to their children. They are left neither root nor branch. He sweeps the earth as with the besom of destruction. He deluges the earth with the fiery floods of his wrath, and the filthiness and abominations of the world are consumed. Satan and his dark hosts are taken and bound. The prince of the power of the air has lost his dominion, for he whose right it is to reign has come, and the kings of this world have become the kingdoms of our God and his Christ. As we see that picture, my brothers and sisters, then it's a picture of unfolding events, and it begins with Zion, and Zion begins with a modern prophet saying, look, let's get on the stick, if I can use an old Western term. Let's reanalyze our lives. Let's arise spiritually and awake spiritually, and let's get to the Book of Mormon and make it really what it ought to be, and apply the principles of the gospel. And if I can refer to the tirade I made just before we conclude the last session. I said there that liberty was born by a group of individuals who didn't have the gospel as we have it, but they learned to read the Bible in a special way. And that special way was to read the book of Romans first, and particularly to read the eighth chapter of Romans. And then, having digested that, then read the gospel of John and John's epistles because John is the great doctrinal writer among the gospel writers, and John is spiritually oriented. And when you've read the book of Romans with a focus on Romans 8, and when you've read and digested the book of John and John's epistles and put them into that context, then read the rest of the Bible. Now, the kind, that kind of approach does this. It puts the Pauline doctrine of spiritual renewal at the basis of gospel study. Have you spiritually been born of God? The early Puritans said that over and over again. They didn't have to read, wait to read Alma 5, verse 14. See? They taught that doctrine, and they ushered in through their efforts what is called historically the Age of the Spirit. And it was an age then where the primary concern of a true Christian was to believe in a living Christ who came from the tomb and who was still alive, and who somehow, in some way, was directing these people in their affairs with the intent of laying a foundation for the ushering in of his millennial reign. And they taught this doctrine, built their lives upon it, got in tune with the Spirit of the Lord, and as Paul says in Second Corinthians chapter 3, that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is the Spirit of liberty. And it was out of this setting that they gave birth to liberty. And it's this program that was 
uh, the program that gave rise to those liberties that we currently enjoy today. Now, if we're going to pick up the ball in a decadent society, in a society that's falling apart at the seams, where everyone is proposing in the talk shows in our area, they all have their proposals as to what we ought to legislate and what we ought to do. But the chief problem is not uh, who's in Washington or what's going on in the state government. The chief responsibility is a spiritual responsibility. And the chief problem is that we are dying spiritually and morally as a nation. We're falling apart at the seams. See? And in the midst of this, then, we have a living prophet that says what these early Puritans say. I can just, uh, uh, somehow, the Lord inspired them, and there was a birth of freedom, and somehow this great and noble man who loved America like he loves his own life has focused in on the very heart and core of what's necessary to save the Constitution and to pull this thing through and at least to pick up the pieces and to establish a Zion society. See? And this, then, is to get to the Book of Mormon, not just to the history of it, but to the living relationship that an individual has with Christ through the Book of Mormon. See, that's what he's trying. And so that's where we are, as I see it. <clears throat> now, in that sense, then, uh, the Lord has given us to understand that his appearance is actually a series of appearances. And if I can just uh, uh, outline those events in general, and these are loose and general things, but in proper sequence of order. And that is that the current situation, if America does not critically sackcloth and ashes repent, the current situation is going to lead to great internal, including economic and financial difficulties that will bring us then to collapse in that sense. And in the midst of that kind of thing, there will be those then who will turn to uh, programs that will require us to scrap the Constitution of this land in favor of a world order which they will put forth as the solution of our problems. And uh, the tide of events will flow so much in that direction that for a person to stand up against that will brand him as idiotic. And in the midst of that, then, the Lord's prophet will speak. Let's fight the battle to save the Constitution. And uh, as Brigham Young prophesied, the Twelve will be sent to Washington, D.C. to bear a message of repentance and of reason and of argument, and the nation will reject that testimony. And when they do, then turmoil and chaos will run rampant. And the warfare against Zion that Nephi sees, and we need to go back and read that prophetic picture from 1 Nephi 14 on through the rest of the prophecies of Nephi into the prophecies of Jacob, and it goes right on through into the Book of Third Nephi, where Jesus picks the picture up, confirms it, and restates it so the Nephites in his day. See, that warfare against Zion will take place, and in the midst of that, then we'll see the boots of enemy soldiers on this land, and there'll be a bloodbath that we have never dreamed of that will make the Civil War seem like it's a Sunday afternoon picnic. And in the midst of that whole thing, then there will be challenges to the saints that will be of such a nature that those saints who are not fully, maturely grounded in the gospel simply will not stand, and they will melt away under the opposition that exists. But those then who follow the living prophet and who are faithful to the spirit of revelation and who develop it and who meet the challenges of adversity and who trust in the Lord, who refines them in the fiery furnace seven times, when he does that, then those who remain will come out pure and clean and committed to the Lord and endowed with his Spirit and with glory and power. And then the Lord will say, Okay, now, in the midst of all of this, let's go back and build Jackson County. And when they do, 
then the great program of the gathering of Israel will take place, then the ten tribes will be revealed in the north country, and uh, the seventh seal will be opened, as referred to in the book of Revelation. And uh, as this finally takes place, and the 144,000 great high priests of the Holy Order are called, Christ will then come and dwell with his saints. And this will be for a period of time. And then uh, the conclusion of this period, you'll have him coming to his temple, and then coming to the great council of Adam on Diamond to gather together all dispensations into this dispensation to make the dispensation of the fullness of times. And for Christ then to stand upon Mount Zion, and with him then that sacred body, the 144,000. And then following this he will go to Jerusalem, and when he delivers the Jews and they rebuild the temple and rededicate it and administer the saving ordinances to the Jewish people, and the nation is born in the day and the Zion order is established among them, then finally a few months after he's made his appearance to the Jews. He will come in his glory in the clouds of heaven, and the earth will be cleansed. And the two great poles of power, one in Zion and the other in Jerusalem, having been established, his law then will be extended throughout the earth, and the millennial era will get underway. Now, basically, that's the picture. Let me just uh, run through with you now on a few scriptures that deal with this subject. <clears throat> Let's begin with section 1 of the Doctrine and Covenants, and I'll put the meat on the bones on this one, if I can, to kind of flesh it out so that we see it more clearly. In section 1, verse 17, uh, as the special preface of the Lord to the Doctrine and Covenants, he says, Wherefore I, the Lord, knowing the calamities which should come upon the inhabitants of the earth, called upon my servant Joseph Smith, Jr., and spake unto him from heaven, and gave him commandments, and also gave commandments unto others that they should proclaim these things unto the world. And so the Lord did all that he could by raising up a modern prophet in order to avert these difficulties. In section 5 of the Doctrine and Covenants, he speaks then of the ultimate consequences of the corruption that we see uh, developing a pace in our midst. And he says in verse 19, For a desolating scourge shall go forth among the inhabitants of the earth, and shall continue to be poured out from time to time, if they repent not until the earth is empty, and the inhabitants thereof are consumed away and utterly destroyed by the brightness of my coming. And he says, Behold, I tell you these things, even as I told the people of the destruction of Jerusalem, and my word shall be verified at this time as it hath hitherto been verified. Now, if we talk, for example, about the alternatives, let me turn to section 49 of the Doctrine and Covenants, where the Lord here is speaking uh, to the world. He makes this statement here, or this comment, beginning with verse 9. He says, Wherefore I say unto you, I have sent unto you mine everlasting covenant, even that which was from the beginning, and that which I have promised I have so fulfilled, and the nations of the earth will bow to it. And if not of themselves, they shall come down, for that which is now exalted that itself shall be laid low of power. The world will either repent and embrace the gospel and this transforming program of spiritual renewal and of, of social and economic justice and the inequity, and if they do not, the judgments are such that it will eventually reduce them to chaos and even, if necessary, to the extent that they're laid low of power. Now, the Lord has given, in the midst of all this, certain alternatives to the Latter-day Saints, section 97 of the Doctrine and Covenant. He talks about the great objective of building the New Jerusalem and the temple in the New Jerusalem. And in verse 15 he says, And inasmuch as my people will build a house unto me in the name of the Lord, and do not suffer any unclean thing to come into it, that it be not defiled, my glory shall rest upon it. That's the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. And my presence shall be there, for I will come into it, and all the pure in heart that shall come into it shall see God. See, that's the guy. That's the goal. That's the ideal. He says, But if it be defiled, I will not come into it, and my glory shall not be there, for I will not come into unholy temples. And now, behold, if Zion do these things, she shall be shall prospered, and spread herself, and become very glorious, very great, and very terrible. And the nations of the earth shall honor her, and she shall surely say, Surely Zion is the city of our God. And, uh, uh, and surely Zion cannot fall, neither be moved out of her place, for God is there, and the hand of the Lord is there. 
and he has sworn by the power of his might to, to be her salvation and her high tower. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, let Zion rejoice, for this is Zion, the pure in heart. Therefore, let Zion rejoice while the wicked shall mourn. For behold, and lo, vengeance cometh speedily upon the ungodly as a whirlwind, and who shall escape it? The Lord's scourge shall pass over by night and by day, and the report thereof shall vex all people just to hear about it. He says, Yea, it shall not be stayed until the Lord come, for the indignation of the Lord is kindled against their abominations and all their wicked works. Nevertheless, he says, Zion shall escape, and here's the qualifying factor, if she observe to do all things whatsoever I have commanded her. Now, that's the qualifying factor, if we do. He says, But if she observe not to do uh, whatsoever I have commanded her, I will visit her according to all her works with sore affliction, with pestilence, with plague, with sword, and with vengeance, and with devouring fire. Now, those are the alternatives the Lord has given us then concerning Zion. And he's told us further than that, that when uh, this time of cleansing, assuming that there will need to be a time of cleansing, not only of the world, but that he will begin his cleansing with his own people. Here in section 112 of the Doctrine and Covenants, beginning with verse 23, he says, Inasmuch as they shall, or rather, verily, verily, I say unto you, darkness covers the earth, and gross darkness the minds of the people, and all flesh has corrupt been, become corrupt before my face. Behold, vengeance cometh speedily upon the inhabitants of the earth, a day of wrath, a day of burning, a day of desolation, of weeping and mourning, of lamentation, and as a whirlwind it shall come upon all the face of the earth, saith the Lord. Now note this in verse 25, And upon my house shall it begin, and from my house shall it go forth, saith the Lord. First among those, among you, saith the Lord, who have professed to know my name, and have not known me, and have blasphemed against me in the midst of my house, saith the Lord. Therefore see to it that you trouble not yourselves concerning the affairs of my church. In this place he goes on and says. Uh, now, what he's saying, then, is that in this day of cleansing, you've got to cleanse the inner vessel of the church first. Why? Because it does very little good <clears throat> to trounce the world and to bring judgments upon them unless they have a clear alternative and can see which way they ought to go. And in order for them to have a clear alternative, since many, many Latter-day Saints, instead of forsaking Babylon, have joined it, then we have to be shaken loose, to use the terminology of the Book of Mormon, from the circumstances that we are in. And we've got to be cleansed. And Zion has got to be raised as a standard and an enzyme. And this doctrine is taught over and over again in the Book of Mormon. Nephi taught it, and then he requested his brother Jacob to come back to it. And so Jacob comes back to it here in 2 Nephi 6, and he says this, for example, <clears throat> quoting Isaiah, I will lift up mine hand to the Gentiles, and set up my standard to the people, and they shall bring thy sons and thy arms, and thy daughters shall be carried upon their shoulders. See, this idea of lifting up a standard to the Gentiles, that idea then is expressed over and over again in the Book of Mormon. And what is that standard? That standard is a group of Latter-day Saints founded on the gospel, an enzyme and a standard to the world, not only spiritually but socially and economically, a righteous people. And the Lord isn't going to bring judgments upon the world who in their ignorance, though they rejected the gospel, wouldn't know what the whole ball game was about, until he gives them an alternative. And the way to give them an alternative is to cleanse Zion and finally raise the standard and the ensign for the world. And so in this sense, judgment then will begin upon his house. Now that cleansing of Zion is going to be a rather devastating and serious thing. It's part of the prophecies of Isaiah, referred to and quoted in the Book of Mormon. I have reference, for example, to Isaiah 49, which Nephi quotes in 1 Nephi 21. 
And here in this chapter, uh, Isaiah speaks of uh, the saints being established in righteousness and Zion being established. Surely you will sing, O heavens, and be joyful, O earth, for the feet of those who are in the east, and Isaiah, those who are in the east of Zion, uh, shall be established, and break forth into singing, O mountains, for they shall be smitten no more, for the Lord hath comforted his people, he hath, uh, and he will have mercy upon his afflicted. And then, having stated that positive objective, then he steps back in time and talks about the travail Zion goes through before that. And he says, But behold, Zion had said, The Lord hath forsaken me, and my Lord hath forgotten me. But he says, But he will show to them that he hath not. For can a woman forget her sucking child, that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Yea, they may forget, he says, Yet will I not forget thee, O house of Israel. Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. And this has reference then to the crucifixion and the events associated with it, and also the temple. Behold, I have engraved in thee upon the palms of my hand, thy walls are continually before me. Thy children shall make haste against thy destroyers, and they that made thee waste shall go forth of thee. Now he's talking about Zion's redemption and the circumstances out of which Zion is redeemed. And in those circumstances, Zion laments and says, the Lord hath forsaken me, and my Lord hath forgotten me. But he says, I haven't. I'm just trying to scrub you up a little bit and get you ready for what's coming. And then he says, In the redemption that takes place, thy children shall make haste against thy destroyer. So there are those then who will destroy Zion, and they that made thee waste. There will be those that make Zion waste, shall go forth of thee. And then he says, Look at thine eyes round about, after these who have oppressed Zion go forth, and Zion is cleansed and purified. Then there will be a tremendous influx of people to Zion, and there will be a mass conversion. We talk about how many people there will be in the church in the year 2020. I'm not saying this will happen by then. My personal feeling is that it will before then, but that's neither here nor there. But the point of the matter is, when Zion has been cleansed, and when the Lord then redeems and establishes her, there will be a conversion to the gospel of Christ such as we have never dreamed of. And he speaks of that here, where he says, Lift up thine eyes round about, and behold, all these gather themselves together, and they shall come to thee, come to Zion. He says, And as I live, saith the Lord. Thou shalt surely clothe thee with them as with an ornament, and bind them on as with a bride, as a bride. For thy waste and thy desolate places, those places that Zion was uh, under judgment and turmoil, thy waste and thy desolate places, he says, shall even be now too narrow by reason of the inhabitants. And they that swallowed thee up, those then who have pressed and who will swallow Zion, and they will. Then he says, They shall be far away. And then he speaks of the mass conversion that comes in, and he says, The children whom thou shalt have after thou hast lost the first shall again say in thy ear, The place is too straight for me, give place that I may dwell. There will be so many of them. Now, who are those in these two categories? The children whom thou hast shall have after thou hast lost the first. Who are the first that are going to be lost? And then who are those afterward that will flow to Zion? Now, those who are going to be last are those that the prophet of the Lord today is pleading with to awake and who are still asleep at the switch. And they will be lost. They will fade away in this time of tribulation. But those then who Zion receives afterward will be so numerous that they will say, The place is too straight for me. Give place to me that I may dwell. And then shalt thou, the Lord says to Zion, say in thine heart, Who hath begotten me these, seeing I have lost my children, and am desolate, a captive, and removing to and fro? And who hath brought up these? Behold, I was left alone. These, where have they been? And then the Lord answers that with his statement, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will lift up mine hand to the Gentiles, and set up my standard to the people. And they shall bring thy sons in their arms, and their daughters shall be carried upon their shoulders, 
and kings shall be thy nursing fathers, and their queens thy nursing mothers. See? Now, we need to go through a transition of repentance, and in that transition this land of America will be cleansed, and the saints will be cleansed. And when we get through those difficult times, the righteous then who endure and who are purified and sanctified by the tribulation, as Isaiah said, Zion shall be redeemed with judgment and her converts with righteousness, when that takes place, then you are going to have such a conversion to the gospel as we have never dreamed. And we are going to make America, the whole of America, the Zion of God. And that's a great big dream, but it's going to happen. Now, in that sense, then, there is a cleansing program, and there is with that, then, deliverance out of bondage. Let me turn to section 103 of the Doctrine and Covenants, where the Lord speaks of the redemption of Zion prophetically. And this revelation was given in 1834, just before Zion's camp took off for, for Jackson County, Missouri. And as the brethren were walking along to Jackson County in Zion's camp, the prophet kind of hung back toward the back of the camp as that body of men were moving along. And he talked to one of the brethren there, and he says, You know, these brethren are going to be disappointed when we get to Missouri. He says, Why so? He said, Because we're not going to redeem Jackson County. And he says, Why so? He said, Because we're not in context with what the Lord has said about it. And then he quoted the revelation now found in section 103 and said, I don't see this happening. This march of Zion's camp is not what the Lord is talking about in section 103. And note what the Lord says, verse 15, Behold, I say unto you, the redemption of Zion must needs come by power. There is going to have to be of necessity a manifestation of power. And he says, Therefore I will raise up unto my people a man who shall lead them as Moses led the children of Israel. And this will be the prophet of God who stands at the head of Zion in that day. And he says, For ye are the children of Israel and of the seed of Abraham, and ye must needs be led out of bondage by power and with a stretched out arm. And then he gives us an example. And as your fathers, the ancient Israelites in Egypt, and as your fathers were led at the first, even so shall the redemption of Zion be. That's the way it's going to happen. And that's why Joseph could hang back, back of Zion's camp and say, Hey, we're not going to redeem Jackson County. I don't see what the Lord talks about here being fulfilled. I don't see us being led like the Israelites were led with the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. And therefore, they're going to be disappointed because we're not going to redeem Zion, or it's going to march down there and back. Now the Lord goes on to say, Therefore let not your hearts faint, for I say unto you, say not unto you, as I said unto your fathers, Mine angel shall go up before you, but not my presence. Remember that episode in, uh, I think it's the 23rd chapter of the book of Exodus? He said, But I say unto you, Mine angels, and it's plural, shall go up before you, and also my presence, and in time ye shall possess the goodly land." Now, that's the setting for the redemption of Zion, a redemption out of bondage, and that bondage is spiritual, economic, and political, and military. And it will be like Israel being led out of Egypt in early days. It will have to be by power. There will be the manifestation of God's power is a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, and his people then eventually will inherit the land. Now, as we see that picture, uh, the redemption of Zion then actually amounts to a transition from what we may call the present order of society in America to the higher, more glorious order of the New Jerusalem and the Kingdom of God. Now, uh, the Book of Mormon in 3rd Nephi chapter 21 makes it very clear that that transition to the higher program can come by natural processes and come peacefully, provided the American people repent and embrace the gospel and build up the church in their midst. That's what the Lord is talking about to the Nephites as he tells them about our day and explains to them the alternatives of the Gentiles in our day. 
And he says, for example, here in 3 Nephi 21, uh, If they will repent, verse 22, and hearken unto my words, and harden not their hearts, I will establish my church among them, and they shall come in unto the covenant, and be numbered among this the remnant of Jacob, unto whom I have given this land for an inheritance. And they shall assist my people, and also as many of the house of Israel as shall come, that they may build a city which shall be called the New Jerusalem. Now, that's the peaceful route, and it can be done on the basis of American people receiving the missionaries, asking the Lord whether Joseph Smith was a prophet, studying the Book of Mormon, embracing the gospel in such numbers, and this, may I suggest, would require national repentance, such numbers that finally we build the New Jerusalem. Now, the other alternative is a lot more gruesome. The issue is not whether the New Jerusalem is going to be built. The issue is how it's going to be built. And the other alternative, the Lord says, for example, quoting Micah on the subject, I will cut off the cities of thy land, speaking of America, and I will throw down thy strongholds, and I will cut off witchcrafts out of thy land, and thou shalt have no more soothsayers. Thy graven images will I also cut off, and thy standing images out of the midst of thee. And he goes on to say, And it shall come to pass that all lyings and deceivings and priestcrafts and whoredoms shall be done away. Now, wouldn't that be marvelous if that happened with America? What would that do to the TV industry and the movie industry? What would that do to Wall Street and Madison Avenue? What would that do to Washington, D.C.? If you finally cleaned house so that all lyings and deceivings and priestcrafts and envies were done away, and he says, For it shall come to pass, saith the Father, that at that day whosoever will not repent and come unto my beloved son, then will I cut off from among my people a house of Israel, and I will execute vengeance and fury upon them, even as upon the heathen, such as they have not heard. And he's talking about America in that one. Now, that's the alternative, and that's the situation. And uh, as that uh, program goes on, then there is a cessation to the times of the Gentiles, and an ushering in, in various stages of development, of what we call the times of Israel. Now, by the times of the Gentiles, we mean that period of time when the great Gentile nations, and the Gentile nations are the nations of Western civilization, uh, Western culture, those nations that uh, uh, center in Europe and the British Isles and so forth. These are the Western nations. And these are the Gentiles. And when the Lord speaks then of the times of the Gentiles, he's talking of their day of opportunity, of the time when they have opportunity to embrace the gospel and their glory and majesty and power and to make the transition to this higher order of peace and brotherhood and love and this higher order of society that's envisioned in the kingdom of God. Now, as the Lord speaks of that in section 45 of the Doctrine of the Covenants, he says this in verse 28, And when the times of the Gentiles is come in, a light shall break forth among them that sit in darkness, and it shall be the fullness of my gospel. Now, when did the times of the Gentiles come in then? And the answer is in the 1820s and 1830s, when a when light broke forth among them. And that light is the fullness of his gospel. He says, But they receive it not, for they perceive not the light. <coughs> And the reason they don't perceive the light, if you read section 84 of the Doctrine and the Covenants, is because they have corruption in their lives, intellectual, spiritual, moral corruption, to the extent then that they are blinded. And he says they perceive not the light, and they turn their hearts from me because of the precepts of men. He says, and in that generation shall the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. And then he talks of the ensuing developments in the generation to follow. And he says there should be men standing in that generation, that is, the generation when the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled, that shall not pass until they shall see an overflowing scourge, for a desolating sickness shall cover the land. But my disciples shall stand in holy places and shall not be moved, but among the wicked men shall lift up their voices and curse God and die. And there shall be earthquakes also in divers places and many desolations. Yet men will harden their hearts against me, and they will take up the sword against one another, <coughs> and they will kill one another. And then he says, Now when uh, I, the Lord, had spoken these words, 
Uh, he says, to my disciples, they were troubles, and who wouldn't be? And uh, I said unto them, Be not troubled, for when these things shall come to pass, ye may know that the promises which have been made unto you shall be fulfilled. And when the light shall begin to break forth, it shall be with them like unto a parable which I will show you. Ye look, and behold the fig trees, <clears throat> and see them with your eyes with your eyes, and you say that they begin to shoot forth, and their leaves are yet tender, that summer is nigh at hand. Even so it shall be in that day. When you see all these things, then shall ye know that the hour is nigh. Now, if you turn to the inspired revision of the Bible, uh, Luke chapter 21. Some of you may have that in the back of your scriptures. Let me just turn to the revelation itself, or the chapter itself. The prophet's clarification that he makes here in Luke 21 is most significant. It's a very, very significant statement, and it gives us some kind of orientation in regard to time. Now, he says, for example, to begin with, that uh, he's talking here to his disciples. And they're wondering about the tribulations that will come to them in their day and also to the times of the world in the future. And so he speaks to them about the destruction of Jerusalem, that the Jews will be destroyed. And he says in verse 23 of the inspired revision of Luke chapter 21, And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, the Jews, and this took place in 68 to 70 A.D., when the Roman army surrounded Jerusalem, took up that siege against them, they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles, and note this, until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Now, the flip side of the coin of that statement is this, that when Jerusalem, and particularly Mount Moriah, is returned to the Jews, this is a sign that the times of the Gentiles officially are fulfilled. And when did this happen? And the answer is 1967. So that the times of the Gentiles, as the Lord explains it here, that when Jerusalem ceases to be trodden down by the Gentiles, and Jerusalem is in the hands of the Jews again, then this is a sign that the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Now that needs to be clarified. Some people have the idea that when the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled the next day, then the millennium is here, or the next day judgments come upon the Gentiles unto their destruction. Now, this is not either the historical or the prophetic picture. For example, in the meridian of time, the ancient times on down through to the meridian of time, we had what we then called the times of Israel. When the Lord Jesus, for example, sent his the disciples out to teach the gospel, he says, Go not by way of the Gentiles, and under the city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. See? And uh, so their message then, uh, during the earthly ministry of Christ, was limited to the people of Israel. For example, there was a woman that came to Jesus. She was a Samaritan woman. Samaritans were half-breeds. They were descendants of those people that the Assyrians shipped in to uh, take the place of the ten tribes who they carried away bodily, hundreds of thousands of them, into Assyria, and then shipped other people into the area. And they intermarried with what remnants of people were left, and they became the half-breed uh, group that we call the Samaritans and that the Jews detested and hated. And this Samaritan woman came to the Savior and said that, she had a problem that she needed his help and his blessings. And uh, I don't think he was uncouth. He was just speaking frankly. He says, it's not meat to take the, child, the meat of the children and give it to dogs. But, like a good woman that she was, and this is pattern for all women, she triumphed. That's the only time that I know of where anyone got the best of the Savior. <clears throat> And she just rolled with the punch, and she came back and says, You're right, true Lord, but the dogs do eat the crumbs that fall from the table of the children. I have need of a blessing, and I left him. 
without any further comment. And he says, Thy faith has made thee whole. Go your way, what you desire will be fulfilled. See? But the point of the matter is that the Lord's program was limited. And it's like in this dispensation. There was a time when the Lord's program in regard to priesthood was limited. Some people can't quite understand that. They think that everything ought to be under democratic principle. But the Lord doesn't operate that way, see? But when Christ was crucified, the veil of the temple was torn asunder and rent asunder. And the times of Israel were terminated because they had crucified their God. And when he came from the grave then, he spoke to his disciples and apostles and he says, Go into all the world and teach the gospel to every creature. And their ministry then was without qualification to every people. Now, in that sense then, the times of Israel were terminated officially at the crucifixion of Christ. But what happened thereafter? Now, the thing that happened thereafter was that when the missionaries went out, like Paul, for example, when they went, when Paul went to Corinth or to Ephesus or uh, to Rome or somewhere else, where's the first place he headed? And the answer is to the Jewish synagogue. <clears throat> and associated with the Jews in their synagogues were groups of people called God-fearers, and they were Gentiles. And Paul, first of all, presented the gospel to the Jews, and they didn't believe very much. And so then he worked among these God-fearers, these people who were Gentiles, and he converted many, many of them. And finally, one day, when the Jews threw stones at him, he stood afar off and says, Now it was necessary for the gospel first to be preached unto you, but since you consider yourself unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. And then when the order of the church was established sufficiently among the Gentiles, then the Lord brought his judgments upon the Jewish people. In 68 to 70 A.D., you have the great event of the siege of Jerusalem and the destruction, and associated with that, then, the colorful besiegement of the city of Masada, which is an interesting place to look down from over the Dead Sea, but uh, the Jewish community there uh, was taken captive, and the Jews then were scattered into all the world. See, Now, what I'm trying to say, then, is that the times of the Gentiles and the times of Israel sequence of things doesn't take place overnight from one to the other. Rather, instead, there is a legal fulfillment, and then there is a bridge-building program from one people to the other. In the New Testament times, that bridge-building program was carried on. And, and then when, the, when the, uh, the people to whom the gospel is then going, as in the case of Paul, the Gentiles are sufficiently strong, then the Lord brings his judgments upon the Gentiles. Now, similarly, he's doing the same thing. He brought about uh, uh, the official termination of the times of the Gentiles when the Jews returned to Jerusalem and gained control of Mount Moriah. And uh, since that time and even before that, we have been building bridges from uh, what we call the Gentile culture to the other cultures of the world. Before World War II, the policy of the Church was basically to go to Western civilization. They had little success elsewhere. B.B. J. Grant, for example, in the 20s, went to Japan. I think he made one convert, and uh, uh, that was it. You had Padre P. Pratt then saying in the key to theology years and years before that Japan will never receive the gospel until she has been subjugated by power. All right, but when World War II was terminated, then President McKay inaugurated a new era. He made it trips into Central and South America, and uh, things opened up. I had a neighbor in Provo who was on a mission the same time I was, from 47 to 49, right after World War II. We both had been in the military, both came home and immediately went into the service of the Lord. He went to Argentina, and he spent two years in Argentina clapping at doors at how you knocked, and never got into one home in two years' time. Never got into one home. And then President McKay went down. They dedicated the land. He met with the political figures of the area, and the country opened up. And the same has been true of Mexico and Central America. 
And the same is true of countries like Taiwan and other places, see. And you have then a bridge-building program from the Gentiles to other cultures. And when that program is sufficiently strong, then the Gentile order will be subject to the judgments of God and will finally come to termination. And that's the picture that we're talking about in the judgments that will come to this land. And in the midst of that, then, you will see the transition that we're talking about. Now, Olson and Carly B. Pratt spoke of that uh, in a very interesting statement given in 1875, way back then. And he says this. He said, now I'm going to prophesy a little. The time is coming when we will be obliged to have a government to preserve ourselves in unity and peace, because they, Americans in general, to be wasted away will not have power to govern. For state will be divided against state, city against city, town against town, and the whole country will be in terror and confusion, mobocracy will prevail, and there will be no security through this great republic for the lives and property of the people. Now, he says, when that time shall arrive, we shall necessarily want to carry out the principles of our great Constitution. And as the people of God, we shall want to see those principles magnified according to the order of union and oneness, not according to the order of party, party, uh, party politics, but according to the order of union and oneness which prevails among the people of God. He says we can magnify the Constitution and all be united without having Democrats and Republicans and all kinds of religions. We can magnify it according to the spirit and love of the Constitution, though we're united in politics and religion and everything else. See? Now he goes on, well then, to return to the prophesying. When the time shall come when the Lord shall waste away this nation, he will give commandment to his people to return and possess their own inheritance which they received, which they purchased in, in Missouri. He says, we intend to go back. And he says, we expect uh, when we do then to implement the program of Zion and its fullness. He says, all that this people will have uh -huh. We will be put into the hands of the servants of God, and each one will receive a stewardship uh, at their hands, without any law interfering from the blood. And all will render an account of their stewardship, and they will fulfill and execute every law pertaining to them, uh, to the income and the tithing thereof, and all will be fulfilled according to the letter of the law. He says, then this people will be united, and then will be a commencement of the fulfillment of that prayer of our Savior repeated so frequently among all Christian nations, a portion of which says, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, how is it in heaven? In heaven the celestial society is established, and it's established on the principles of Zion, the full law of Zion, and it's endowed with glory, even the glory of the celestial kingdom. And then there's a principle of government to govern the terrestrial according to a righteous law of liberty but justice. And then from the terrestrial there's a government of the telestial. Now that's how it is in heaven. And when you want to establish that order of things on this earth, then you've got to have a people who establish the law of the celestial kingdom in their lives. You've got to start there. And this then, as Orson Pratt explains, will be the nucleus. He says, that will be the nucleus or beginning of it. He says, but there will be an approximation to it here in these mountains. He says, we will learn a great uh, many pure principles to enable us to carry out the law as far as we possibly can, the welfare program and other things, see, under the circumstances we are placed in here. He says, but then there will be a full execution of that law. He says, now that order of things will continue and will spread from that uh, for forth in that nucleus in Jackson County and the western counties of Missouri and the eastern counties of Kansas where this people will be located and will spread abroad for hundreds and hundreds of miles on the right hand and on the left, east, west, north, and south in the great central city. And all the people will be required to execute the law and all their stewardships. And then there will be a oneness in the union which will continue and will spread wider and wider and become greater and greater until the desolate cities of the Gentiles will be inhabited by the saints. Then will be fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, and this is Isaiah 54, in which he says, Thy seed shall inherit the Gentiles and make the desolate cities to be inhabited. Now that's merely a commentary on the Book of Mormon. You can get the same picture out of 3 Nephi 21 and 22. In 3 Nephi 21, as we've already read, the Lord gives the alternatives that are open to the Gentiles. 
repent and peacefully build up the kingdom of God, establish the church, and become a righteous people through embracing the gospel, and then build the new Jerusalem and do the work peacefully without any violent disruption. If you don't, then the alternative, he says, is that he will execute vengeance and fury upon the Gentiles such as they have not heard, so that all lyings and deceivings and priestcrafts and whoredoms shall be done away. And then you will build the new Jerusalem. Now, having quoted that picture of things and the building of the new Jerusalem, then he puts into the Book of Mormon text a whole chapter of Isaiah, Isaiah 54. And he indicates that then this chapter will be fulfilled. He says, Then shall that which is written come to pass. Sing, O barren, thou that didst not bear. Break forth into singing, thou that didst not travail with child, for more shall be the children of the vessel than of the married wife, saith the Lord. Now that's a marvelous thing. That's going to come to pass. Now let me ask you, what's going to come to pass? Well, let me quote it again. Sing, O barren, thou that didst not bear. Break forth into singing, thou that didst not travail with child, for more shall be the children of the desolate than of the married wife, saith the Lord. Now, what's he talking about? Well, the key to it is to understand that the Lord always views himself as a married man. He always views himself as being in a married relationship with his people. In ancient Old Testament times, Jehovah had a wife. And who was that wife? Israel, right? It was Israel, and uh, he was, uh, he's, the, he's the bridegroom, and his people is the bride. And when you say, prepare the bride for the bridegroom comes, you're talking about cleaning up and polishing up the, the bride or the wife or the church in preparation for the coming of Christ. Now, in ancient times, he had a bride, a wife, and uh, his wife's name was Israel. But she ran off with the traveling salesman, and she forsook the Lord. And he later asked in Isaiah, Where is your bill of divorce? And I didn't put you away. You just ran off and left me, see? But when she ran off, and the times of the Gentiles, Israel fulfilled, then he went out like a good man ought to do and married himself another wife. And uh, the other wife that he married was the Gentiles, right? And the Gentiles then became the... Uh, uh, had the same position of Israel, so that you have, for example, Kipling is a great recessional, uh, saying, I'm drunk with sight of power, we loose wild tongues that have not the in awe, such boasting as the Gentile Jews, or lesser breeds without the law. Now, uh, the Englishmen were not Gentiles, it was those lesser breeds without the law that are Gentiles. England is Israel, you see that? And, uh, they, and the Gentiles, then, are Israel. They were assumed the position of Israel, that when this time of which Isaiah speaks takes place, then the times of the Gentiles will be fulfilled, and the times of Israel will return. And so, having spoken then of the cleansing of America, having spoken of the building of the new Jerusalem, and the establishment of the Lord's kingdom on this earth, and the gathering in of Israel to the new Jerusalem. Then he quotes Isaiah, Sing, O barren, thou that is not barren. Who is he talking about? The barren wife. This is Israel, right? She's going to come back in. She's going to come home to hubby. Okay? If I can put it that way, and I apologize for the unsacredness of the expression. But she's going to come home to the Lord. And so he says, Sing, O barren. Thou that didst not bear, break forth into singing, thou that didst not travail with child. So Israel never brought people through the process of spiritual rebirth to become sons and daughters of Christ. They've been scattered and they've been broken off. And they've been out of the picture in the sense of the great program of spiritual renewal by which people become the sons and daughters of Christ. And so he says then, sing O barren though, because it's time for her to sing because she's coming back in. They force into saying, Thou that did not travail with child, for more shall be the children of the desolate. And who's the children of the desolate? That's Israel. When the ten tribes roll in, when the Indian people in large measure become converts, and when the, the whole thing shifts then from the times of Israel to the, the times of the Gentiles to the times of Israel, 
Then he says, for example, More shall be the children of the desolate than of the married wife, saith the Lord. And who's the married wife? The Gentiles. So do you sit down and number the membership of the church? You say, now we've got these many people that come from Western civilization. We identify with the Gentiles. And they will be far less numerous than those people then who come from the more pure Israel stock, and who then are spoken of as the maid or the, the desolate wife. And then speaking of that transition of things, the times of the Gentiles being fulfilled and the times of Israel being ushered in, then speaking of Zion, Zion likened to a tent with a sentry place and with supporting states around. He says, Enlarge the place of thy tent. Now go in your mind to Jackson County where the center place will be established. Enlarge the place of thy tent, and let them stretch forth the curtains of thy habitation. Spare not, lengthen thy cords, and strengthen thy stakes, for thou shalt break forth on the right hand and on the left, and thy seed shall inherit the Gentiles and make the desolate cities to be inhabited. Now, what desolate cities? Those desolate cities the Lord talks about when he speaks of the judgments that will come to this land if we don't repent, when he says, I will cut off the cities of our land and throw down thy strongholds. And then when the redemption of Zion goes forth, and the times of the Gentiles are fully terminated, and the times of Israel come back in, and the desolate wife has more children in the kingdom than the married wife, and Zion extends herself from Jackson County, as Orson Pratt says, the western counties of Kansas, I mean, Missouri and eastern counties of Kansas, and it spreads forth abroad and becomes stronger and stronger, and they inherit the cities of the Gentiles and make them habitable and build them up. Now, what we're talking about is the transition of cultures. It is not a correct principle that when the elders save the Constitution instrumental in it, that we're going to perpetuate the Washington, D.C. program. This simply is not in the cards. Rather, instead, the Constitution will be discarded and trampled, and the elders of Israel will pick it up out of the dust. And standing on the backbone of the American continent, they will establish it and extend its program abroad. And when it's extended abroad and the great redemption of Zion takes place, then that sacred law of liberty will be extended throughout the land. They will be sustained by the elders of Israel and in the kingdom of God. And then there will be a tremendous influx of people, a tremendous conversion of people to that order. And as Zion says, Zion will say then, These where have they been? I've lost my children, and these where did they come from? And the Lord says, I will raise up an incline and a standard among the nations, among the Gentile peoples, and then I'm going to gather my people. And my brothers and sisters, this great work of building Zion is still before us. And the greatest events of this earth are yet in the future, in the very, very near future. And there are many here tonight who will live to see this transition fairly well through to its conclusion. And there will be those among our young people who will be a part of this. And they will see a new birth of liberty in America, and they will see a new spiritual foundation laid, and this then through blood and through sweat and through tears and through toil. And they'll also see in the process then those who are, who are uh, spiritually unalive, spiritual apathy, fade away. They may have testimonies, but so did the four or five foolish virgins. And we'll see, though, out of this whole transformation, a change in the direction of things that will bring about the Lord's program. Now, that's the thing that we're talking about, and that's what the Book of Mormon is about, and that's what the Doctrine and Covenants is about. And it's spelled out over and over again as you really get into the works and find out what's there. Now, the Lord bless us, my brothers and sisters. We've got a living prophet who, aged though he may be, is still a prophet. And in my opinion, he's given to us some of the most important declarations and statements of doctrine that we have received in this century. In fact, I don't know of a prophet in this century who has given as pertinent and meaningful statements 
as Ezekiel Benson. I simply don't know of a prophet in this state, in this generation, who has done so in this century. And we are essentially asleep at the switch, and we are failing to take his warning that we are under condemnation, and that we need spiritual renewal. We need to get the Book of Mormon, not just to find about about the the ancient ruins and where Kamara was and all of that stuff. We need to get to the Book of Mormon to find Christ and to be regenerated spiritually in Christ and become alive and to get the gifts of the Spirit in our lives. Now, the Lord bless us that we might do that, because if we don't, then the other alternative is open to us, and believe me, it will be a better one. And it will be better even, regardless of which alternative, but those then who do it the right way. They'll be refined and purified, and they'll come out at the other end of the tunnel prepared to build Zion society, just like in the Nephites. The whole drama of events in 3rd Nephi finally brought a people who are ready for the Zion society. And this is a type and a shadow of that which is taking place in our time. How the Lord bless us, my brothers and sisters, to see, appreciate, and do this, something about it, I pray humbly, in the sacred name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We have about five minutes and three interesting questions. What about the Muslims? Are they part of the Gentiles or Israel? The answer is, the Muslims are not Gentiles, neither are the Russians. <clears throat> In this whole period of the times of the Gentiles, how much have we taught the gospel to the Muslims and how much have we taught to the Russians? We haven't. In the times of the Gentiles, are officially over. Now, on the other hand, the Muslims descend from Abraham, and among the Russians there are many, many people who, in the sense of bloodlines, go back to Israel. And uh, the ten tribes of Israel were taken captive into Assyria for a time, and there were literally hundreds and thousands of them who were taken captive. They were there until Nineveh fell. <coughs> Nineveh was the capital of Assyria. And when Nineveh fell, they took advantage of that opportunity, and they fled out of the area. And they went up between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea, through the Caucasus Mountains. And they bumped off into southeast Europe. Some of them went north and became the Cossacks of Russia. Some of them went east and as far over into Japan and into, into uh, China and India. There was a group of them, particularly uh, those people then who had the blood of Ephraim in them, who went on up into the German midlands. And then from the German uh, woodlands, a group of them, the Angles and the Saxons and the Jews, about 400 A.D., after the Romans had left the British Isles, went into, Israel, in, into Great Britain. And uh, people of that area and subjugated the Celts who had been there earlier and so forth. And uh, uh, it's largely then from these people, the populated Northern Europe and the British Isles that we as Latter-day Saints descend. And as far as I'm concerned, I'm not an adopted Gentile. I have a patriarchal blessing that says, The blood of the royal house of Israel flows through your veins, and you are the seed of Ephraim. Now, in that sense, then, I have a bloodline that goes back through into Northern Europe and England and back then through into the southeast Europe, and back through into the Assyrian captivity, and from there back then to the northern kingdom of Israel. See? And uh, when we talk about the Muslims then and the Gentiles, and, and uh, uh, are they Gentiles? And the answer is no. That they are of Israel, and not of Israel, but of Abraham. Keep in mind that the promised bloodlines come through Isaac, as Paul says, in Isaac is thy seed. And uh, there's also a scattering of Israel among them in their midst. And that's true then of the Russian people, and it's true of a lot of other people, including the people of Africa. There's a lot of the blood of Israel there. Is this prophet who will lead the people the Davidic king? And the answer is no. Who is the remnant of Jacob who treads down and tear it in pieces? Is this if this refers to Zion, will it be required to kill our fellow man? 
President Grover Fielding Smith made some clarifications on that, and if you'll study carefully the Book of Mormon and other scriptural passages on it, the running of Jacob who goes through among the Gentiles like a lion among the beasts of the forest and a young lion among the flocks of sheep, which is spoken of in Pete by chapter 16, again in chapter 20, and again in chapter 21. This is a broader picture than the Indian people. It will include Ephraim, it will include the ten tribes when they come, and uh, but it will not be that kind of thing that's lawless. It will be, in some instances maybe, where people are not converted to the gospel, and there's some elements of them, and they're just uh, uh, releasing the pent-up feelings that they've had, having been among the Gentiles so long and been under the thumb of the Gentiles. And we've been playing cowboys and Indians with them, and they've turned the tide on us and playing Indians and cowboys. Uh, when that time comes then, yes, there'll be those, I suspect, then, who may act with indiscretion and lack of wisdom, and it will be a lawless type of thing. But generally speaking, there will be a matter of cleansing the, the land uh, of uh, corruption, administering law and order, and establishing the kingdom of God on the earth in the place of Hippieville and uh, Aidsville and you name it, see. Now, don't quote me as saying that if some good liberal has me by the neck before I get out of Snowflake. <clears throat> now, we're involved, though, with a situation, I've said, of uh, gathering and establishing Israel. And that program basically is a peaceful program. It's founded in truth. It's founded in love. It's founded in the Lord's law. It's also found in justice. It's also found in the administration of justice, properly speaking. See, and so it's under that kind of program that will be done. Well, as the old judge said, as he sentenced the convict to a hundred years plus, that's about all the time there is. I just want you to know that it's been a thrill to be with you today. I've got through the first nine hours. And I assure you that I'm going to get through the next nine hours and then the next nine hours and with the Lord's help. And I can't do without it. And you're trapped in the Octagarian level in your age. You have to be supported and sustained by the Spirit in order to do such a naive and radical but joyous and happy thing that uh, we've engaged in here to do. I just want you to know that I thrill with it. I love to have my darling wife with me. Within the gospel framework, she's the greatest thing that I have, and she's had the greatest influence in my life of any person that I know. And she has superior gifts to those that I have, and I thank her for that, gifts of wisdom and gifts of charity and uh, gifts that supersede mine. The Lord has blessed me with some of the more vocal and external gifts, but I just want you to know that it's a pleasure to be not only here with you but to be here with her, with you, and to have this opportunity to be away and to share these things together and to have uh, her with me in doing so. And I bear you my testimony that God lives, that I know it, that I know with a perfect knowledge that God lives. I have had the kind of experience with the Spirit that reaches up beyond the veil and through the veil, and I know by personal revelation and by personal experience that Jesus is the Christ. I know that he's alive today. He is the most alive person who is on earth and in this universe today. And he is directing this work. And those then who fear and tremble need to learn to place their reliance in him. Because if you'll give your life without reservation and commitment to him, you'll find a strength and an inspiration and a life and a blessing coming to your life that you have never really felt before. And actually, it's only under those circumstances that we can survive. It's only on that basis that I personally can make war with myself and be triumphant. It isn't through any effort of my own, it's through him. And I give honor and glory to him and thank him for his privilege and bear testimony of his work in the sacred and holy name of Jesus Christ. Amen.